us on an incredible expedition. A journey that takes us more than 5,000 kilometres through the outback of three states. Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia. Meet some very dangerous Australians and experience some of the world's most dramatic and desolate landscapes. Discover strange wildlife, native animals and feral pests and watch some of them behave in totally unexpected ways. In this two-part special, we find areas of desert changing from parched sand to flood and see the effect it has. We'll travel to the edge of the Nullarbor Plain and see a spectacular show by 40 whales, a performance that's totally remarkable. We're here in southeast Queensland and this is the start of the Dingo Fence. Now the Dingo Fence was established in the 1800s. Now it firstly was established as a vermin proof fence. You have a look down the bottom here, this finer mesh, that was to stop rabbits. Now rabbits were an introduced species, they came into Australia in the early 1800s, so they initially tried to stop the rabbits, and then the dingoes became a large problem because they were killing so many sheep. So they built it up in height, bigger mesh, and this was the dog-proof fence. This is the start of the fence that stretches over 5,000 kilometers. Our journey will take us two-thirds of the distance across the continent. So here we go along the dingo fence. <laughs> This is believed to be the longest man-made barrier in the world, almost double the length of the Great Wall of China. Even though the Great Wall certainly is more substantial, the dingo fence is still doing the job it was originally built for, controlling an animal that sheep farmers believe has been one of the greatest threats to their survival on the land. To see how dingoes fight over a few scraps of food, you can appreciate just how tenacious these predators can be. As much as some hate them in the bush, they're still admired. Power, endurance and sheer cunning make the dingo a most remarkable dog. It's also a superb hunter and can survive where most other animals would perish in no time at all. The Aborigines were the first Australians to utilise the dingo. However, in the middle of the last century, white settlers crossed dingoes with Scottish blue merle collies and Dalmatians to breed the Australian blue healer, now recognised as probably the best cattle dog in the world. A dingo's colour can range from almost pure white right through to black, but this is the most common colour and the one people most easily recognise. The Australian wild dog has had a price on its head since 1830. Around the turn of the last century, the bounty on their scalp was so high you could get rich hunting them. Dingoes have survived every effort to wipe them out, and today they're still considered by some as outlaws. Dingoes are trapped, poisoned or shot wherever they're found. We started finding their carcasses from the very moment we started our journey along the Queensland section of the fence, known here as the barrier fence. All fences are farmers' friends, essential for controlling stock and animal movements, but for wildlife, fences are a menace, something they don't understand and something that they don't know how to handle. It wasn't only dingoes we found dead along the way. Kangaroos, wallabies, emus, any animal at all that might get tangled in wire was caught in the various fences that crisscrossed the outback and linked to the dingo barrier. The battle against the dingo costs millions of dollars a year. All three states involved fund separate workforces for maintenance. 
In the middle of nowhere, workers and sometimes their families live in camps and bush cottages to keep the dingoes on one side and the sheep safe on the other. At least that's what they're trying to do. A simple looking fence sometimes isn't so simple. This low tech but clever design copes with floods. Well, as the water comes down from here, it just pops up. But no animals can walk in. Yeah, exactly. Like a dingo's going to come in and push like that and not come through. Right. I get it. Yeah. Some farmers believe the fence is the difference between profit and bankruptcy. They say that one dingo may kill a dozen sheep when one would be enough to eat. And without this maintenance work, their flocks would be decimated. When the fence starts to get too old, it's a better proposition to bulldoze the worn section and build a new fence rather than try to repair rotten posts and rusted wire. So there's not much of the original barrier left. It's gradually being replaced. The job is rebuilding rather than maintenance. Because the fence line is a well-used animal track, it's an obvious place to use other methods of controlling dingoes. The dingo fence is not the only way that we have of controlling predators. There are several different types of poisons or baits that are used also. The 1080 bait is probably the most common, and it doesn't discriminate against what it kills. This is a fox. The fox is not a native species to Australia. It was actually introduced. The fox is a very excellent killer, and it hunts many of the native animals almost to the brink of extinction. We have to be very careful traveling this maintenance track, even in the best condition. But if the weather turns bad, it can be very treacherous. We're heading towards the Bolu River. And if those rain clouds turn out to be more than just a passing shower, we could end up trapped on the floodplain. They don't get much rain out here, and a good fall is cause for the farmers to celebrate. But we need to keep moving to get ahead of the rising river. And of course, that's just when the emus decide to get up to their old tricks. We're driving slowly and we can't swerve. The road's too slippery for that. One of by the dingo fence, and we've already seen what that can do. Thanks to Suey the dog, she's headed the emu off to safe. We've decided to keep driving through the night. With this heavy rain, the river will be coming up fast. Today the rain's eased, but the ground has been turned into one big skid pan. We'll leave the fence and head to safer ground, but it's still a race against time. The river keeps rising long after the rain stops. There's a causeway in this one here, so what I'm going to have to do is I'll go cut some sticks out and um, put markers along and then drive through. We've got the snorkel on, so... Okay. You'll walk it first. Yeah, I'll have to walk. Oh, mate, I've got no idea what's out there. Mm -hmm. There's a big causeway, you know, okay. with a huge, great drop-off. We drop off in there, that's it. There goes our truck. Okay. Gone. There isn't a choice. Steve has to walk the entire length of the causeway, checking the edges and marking the drop-off. There's no margin for error. 
The causeway is only as wide as one traffic lane, and the drop-off could be enough to completely submerge the truck or tip it over. Well, this is it. We have to keep the vehicle going steady all the way across. We can't afford to pause or stop. If we do, we're certain to get bogged and possibly washed off the causeway. Aren't you guys cute? Thank you. Aren't you a little cutie? Hey, you've got short legs. Oh, you've got a big mouth and look out Terry, he's stiff as a board. He's stiff as a board, he'll bite ya. These little devils we've got here, this is a male and a female shingleback. Now they're skinks and they live in some of the most arid parts of Australia. You can see along their body, they've got those very hard shell-like scales on them and that's to conserve water. They're a very rugged little creature, very short legs, very slow moving. Oh, oh you wouldn't bite me, would you? You guys wouldn't bite me, would you? Oh, you would. <laughs> would you? How about you? You would. Easy to tell they're a skink, because they've got a very thick, fleshy tongue. Beautiful little animals, absolutely glorious. I think they're in love. I think they might be. Are you chasing this little girl down here? You're a funny little lizard. We're well and truly past the rain, and after being sidetracked by the Bolu River, we can now head back and continue our journey along the fence line. The Queen went up in 1960, the world's longest fence was finally completed. The Queensland Barrier Fence joined up with the border fence of New South Wales, which in turn connected with South Australia's dog fence. Three fences run by three different authorities for the one purpose. It's easy to look at it and wonder why an animal would attempt to cross. It looks exactly the same on both sides. You can explain the dingoes wanting to get through. There's sheep on the inside of the fence. But what about other animals, the vegetarians? It could be as simple as the nearest water hole. They can smell the water, but they can't get through. Wildlife have also developed complex migratory patterns that have been completely disrupted by the fence line. Here's another dead emu, literally thousands along this section of the fence. Poor buggers, they've gone through pretty harsh times. Pretty obvious cause of death for this one here. Broken leg. Leg's been snapped. Probably in a weakened condition, maybe a stampede. Hit the fence too hard. Bit of a shame. While poisoning accounts for the deaths of large numbers of dingoes, the authorities want to ensure that most of these predators are eradicated from the sheep grazing area. This is a dingo bitch, full-grown dog. Now, what's happened is, I'd say this one's been shot rather than poisoned. I can tell that because it's been scalped, right? From the nose, a strip of skin taking in the ears, all the way up the backbone and the tail. That's all been scalped off. There's a bounty, a $10 bounty on dingoes. You scalp them, cash it into the government, you get $10. Now, once the animal's been shot, normally the fence patrolmen, the graziers, managers, stock hands, when they shoot a dingo, they'll string it on the fence. And when they string it on the fence, they'll string it on the side of the fence that the dog was shot. Or if they shoot it out in the paddock, they'll stick it on a tree. That gives people an idea of what dingoes are in the area and what side of the fence they're on. Being full on wildlife people 
and the owners of a zoo where we care for hundreds of animals, we find it very difficult to come to terms with seeing dead animals strung up in fences and trees. The sight of dead animals of every sort is something we cannot get used to when traveling the outback. What a shame. There's a stack of animals get caught up in the barrier fence. Here's a little willy wagtail. Got his head caught in between the two chunks of wire. Real pity. Even with this relentless campaign against the dingo, it doesn't seem in danger of extinction. Unlike two animals that held the dingo's territory before its arrival. The Tasmanian tiger and the Tasmanian devil were both common on the mainland of Australia. These carnivorous marsupials were no match for the power of the dingo, and now only the devil survives, and only in Tasmania where there are no dingoes. We've stopped near a series of caves, the sort of places where marsupials like to shelter in the heat of the day. I'd go around if I was you. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeez, big old guy, this one. Hey, Ted! Yeah? You should see the size of these big red kangaroos in here, Dad. Stiff as a board. Hey, red kangaroos too. So obviously they've lived in this cave. Yeah, I'd say, well, as you can see, it's the coolest, shadiest part out in this uh, arid area. So they come up here, inevitably you're going to die up in here in the shade. Much better than dying out there under a tree. Mm -hmm. You see me? And kangaroos weren't the only animals living Boys. here. Birds nest, but no birds. Yeah, classic, aren't they? What do these guys do? They must have to depend on a rainy season to get the mud to build these things. I see down inside this one, there's a little bit of straw in there. A little bit of dead grass. Look at you! Are you a bit naughty? Are you a little bit aggressive? <laughs> what we've got here, this is a bearded dragon. I mean, this is the central version. They don't get quite as big as the ones on the coast. Bearded dragon, you can see why they're called a bearded dragon. They've got this little beard here, and when he gets all cantankerous, all cranky, or you've got a big mouth too, he opens up his mouth and shows this beard and that, a sign of toughness. I am so tough, stay away from me or I'm going to bite you. Oh, <clears throat> you bit me on the nose, you little brat. You can see quite an awesome little guy. <laughs> Doesn't matter how big I am, he's going to have a go. You're too tough for your own good, little fella. Very naughty. Very naughty. <laughs> Budgery gars are one of Australia's most widespread parrots and probably the world's most popular pet bird. This is the centre of their range in the heart of the Australian outback. These tiny birds are feeding on grass seed. When conditions are favourable, they breed up into enormous flocks. At times there are so many you can hardly see the sky but when they perch in trees, they blend straight in with the leaves. Getting a close look needs the zoom lens of a camera or a pair of binoculars. Budgery guards are extremely nomadic. They'll travel a long way in these huge flocks to descend on a good feeding spot or in search of a waterhole. This is remarkable synchronized flying. It's like they form one creature twisting and turning in precise formation. Because there is no traffic, 
Spotting wildlife and getting close is fairly easy. They're not used to seeing humans, so there's little fear. We're no danger to them. You can see here, here's another dingo, a juvenile, only a youngster, this little one. It's been scalped for its bounty. Up here you've got a really interesting picture. You can see this dingo, this is a large dog that's been shot here. It's also been scalped for its bounty. But what's happened here is this eagle has come down pretty hard times, come down to feed on the carcass, and it's got caught up in the mesh. Once caught up in the mesh, I'd say it's died a pretty tragic death. one group of animals that won't end up tangled in a fence. Most stock animals have too much horse sense, developed over countless generations of domestication. We're now leaving Queensland and moving into New South Wales, the section of dingo fence known as the border fence. It follows the line of the New South Wales state borders with Queensland and South Australia. It's an unbreakable law in the bush. When you use a gate, you shut it behind you, or if it's open, you leave it open. Of course, the gate in the dingo fence is one that is always shut. The dingo fence with the huge number of dead animals on both sides of it attracts scavenging animals that feed on carrion. Practically every time we looked into the sky, there was a bird of prey circling overhead looking for food. Steve's pointing out the continuous dents in the mesh made by wildlife as they hit the fence at high speed. And these little fellas are another pest the sheep farmers would dearly love to eradicate. Rabbits have outnumbered sheep and eaten their pasture for much of the last hundred years. And nearby, another pest, the fox. An animal that lives very well here by hunting the rabbits. The problems caused by rabbits are enormous. They go for the best pasture and can wipe out plant species in a whole region. They compete with sheep for food and destroy native animals' habitat. The first rabbits in Australia were brought here for man to hunt. And speaking of hunting, Suey would like nothing better than to dig down and get those rabbits out of their burrows. The rabbits have had their ups and downs as a feral pest. The myxomatosis disease was introduced to control the plague and it virtually wiped them out in the early 1950s. But they've now developed a resistance to the disease and controlling them is again a problem. Keeping these fences maintained is a constant challenge. The little pests are always trying to get under. As you can see with these holes, the rabbits, as they're kicked out, are trying to find new territories and they're constantly challenging the fence. We've got over 5,000 kilometers of pest-proof fencing and it keeps a lot of people employed. You can see with this hole right here, it actually goes right under the fence. So this is going to be cause for someone to have to repair it. Even though we get a lot closer to them here than we would in most places, it's still not near enough for a good look. We figure there should be a better chance if we wait until dark. Rabbits also know that it's better to be more active in the cooler hours in a climate like the Australian outback. Like many animals after dark, the rabbit can be momentarily stunned by a strong light. It looks like it's going to be a matter of patience. They stop when the light hits them, but they don't keep still for long. Oh, another one that got away. The whole history of the rabbit in this country has been one story after another about how they got away. Although domestic rabbits came with the first fleet, wild rabbits were deliberately introduced into Victoria in 1859. And of course, 
they got away. By the 1880, the rabbit plague had reached Queensland. They now think someone carried the rabbits north, and of course, they got away too. not from Australia. You're not an Australian. This little guy is actually from Europe and was imported over here in the 1800s and has done quite well for himself. In fact, that's why originally the dingo fence was built. It was actually, in the beginning, a rabbit fence. You are quite a good breeder, too, and they've spread throughout Australia, causing a lot of problems. While spotlighting for rabbits, Steve spots something he never expected to see in a lifetime an amazing frog that lives deep in the outback. I just love frogs, and this is such an experience, such a privilege for me. The rains that we've just been through have stimulated these little blighters to come out of their burrows. This is Cyclorana, and they're water-holding frogs found in the most arid conditions in Australia, possibly the world. They build like a little plastic membrane around their body and they'll bury themselves deep into this clayish mud type stuff and they can stay under the ground for years literally years without any water and as soon as it rains get a puddle like this that envelope will break they'll break through it they'll tear their way out and away they go they'll start feeding going through their mating cycle and breeding and then they'll dig themselves back into the dirt into that clay stuff again until the next wet season very important australia's water holding frogs are very unique they have the ability to retain water in their bladder they burrow under the ground and build a cocoon like chamber which they line with sloughed or shed skin this chamber allows the frog to survive extreme heat and long dry periods, sometimes several years in length. Now after good rains, it emerges from the burrow and feeds and breeds in the temporary pools in the clay pan. The water lying around here in one of Australia's most arid regions came from somewhere else. It fell in Queensland, hundreds of kilometres away. There's been no rain here at all. This water fell days ago. When it really pours out here, large parts of the dingo fence disappear entirely under the water. And on low-lying sections, in the gullies and dips, the fence could go under without a drop of rain falling anywhere close. The runoff can cause problems a long way from the rainfall. One of the rare sights of the outback. The red sands of the inland deserts dotted and sometimes surrounded by sheets of water. And when there is water like this, wildlife moves in from right around the area. It won't be long before this part of the dingo fence bursts into flower. We won't be here to see it, but after rain there's an explosion of wildflowers, and for a short time the desert blooms. It looks like this kangaroo is trying to outrun us. All the life that survives in this harsh climate relies on these occasional rains. 
The water won't last long, so the wildlife takes full advantage of the few short days before the water evaporates in the outback heat. As we push ahead at a steady pace, we notice that another red kangaroo is striding beside the truck. We decide to stop so Steve can take some photos. As we said, this track is definitely not for public use. We've already seen the dangers from the weather conditions and poison baits, and now we find another trap for the unwary. This is a set leg hold trap. She's ready to go. Something puts its foot on that pressure pad, whammo, off it goes. Now this chain that comes off it, that goes to a weight buried down in the sand, such that when the animal's trapped, it can't pull that weight away, so it's trapped here, easy for the trapper to find the animal. Now these things are extremely dangerous, very, very dangerous. You imagine your foot gets stuck in there, it's going to inflict a lot of pain, and perhaps even some breakages. These things are wild, and that's why it's very important that you don't go mucking around on the dingo fence. These things are in place, and the general public should be aware of them, don't come here. Dingo scalps are left to dry in the sun before being handed in for the bounty. The dingo dies quicker when trappers smear strychnine on the claws of the trap. The natural instinct is for the wounded dog to lick at its trapped leg, getting the poison in its mouth. Strychnine poisoning follows and death comes rapidly. As we push south along the New South Wales side of the border fence, we look over into South Australia and see that their emus are just as silly as the rest of them. This part is maintained by New South Wales, and it's the shortest section of the dingo fence, just 584 kilometres. On the South Australian side, Another sign reminds us that traveling the dingo fence is not your everyday drive in the country. If you wonder about whether the fence does the job it was designed for, look at the location of sheep stations in Australia. Very few of them are outside the fence. Some have tried to set up on the wrong side of the barrier, but most give up very quickly. It's marginal country anyway, and farmers accuse the dingoes of tipping the balance. Crossing back and forth into South Australia, this is the only section of fence with a name describing what it is for, the dog fence. A wedgetail eagle watches from his roadside perch. These kings of the outback skies are one of the few native predators that would have any chance of taking a dingo pup. Not all of the dingo fence runs through completely arid country. There are a few spots like this one, a lake on the South Australian side of the border. It really is an oasis in the desert, and when we came through, there was an incredible variety of bird life making use of such a large stretch of water. And snuffling about near the lake, one very, very tough customer and destructive immigrants. I've never seen a Razorback act so relaxed when a bunch of humans turn up in a truck. Normally a feral pig will bolt for cover so fast you won't even know he's there. This one even seemed to think we should be the ones to leave. Well, Stephen Suey can't have that. The feral pig is one of Australia's greatest menaces and eradicating them is proving even more difficult than wiping out the rabbit plague. Get it, Sue! Get it! Get around me! 
She got a big pig. A wild boar has razor-sharp tusks they have been known to kill. feral pig, an introduced species. They're devastating in Australia where they're not native to. A lot of people hit them, sports shoot them, they eat them. Right at this moment, they're being killed and sent to Germany as wild game. Quite an impressive animal, very strong. And uh, tell you what, with those tusks, he'd split me from one end to the other. This wild boar made one big mistake. I'm used to restraining large animals in the water. Next, when we continue our journey along the dingo fence, the longest fence in the world, we see a pack of wild dingoes and encounter the deadly western brown snake. We explore the ruins of early settlements and get into trouble in an old mine shaft. Spotlight foxes, feral animals that are wreaking havoc with our wildlife. We capture some special footage of Australia's largest bird of prey in a fight over food. Experience the salty surface of Lake Eyre, Australia's lowest point. And our journey finishes at the Great Australian Bight on the Noabore Plain where we witness the amazing sight of 40 whales in the ocean. Mm -hmm. 